Hello everyone, my name is Anthony with Succeeding in Nursing School, and in this episode I am going to be discussing heart failure. However, we will not just be discussing the pathophysiology of heart failure. In this episode, we will also discuss signs and symptoms, nursing considerations, pharmacological measurements, and differentiating between left and right-sided heart failure as well as the causes. To begin, we need to know what heart failure really is. Heart failure itself is not a condition, rather it is a response to cardiac dysfunction, a state where the heart is unable to pump enough blood to meet the metabolic needs of the body tissues. Because of this, any condition that affects the heart's ability to pump or fill can cause heart failure. Most commonly, you're going to see this caused by MIs, cardiomyopathies, uncontrolled hypertension, valvular dysfunction such as stenosis or regurgitation, and any kind of inflammatory condition such as endocarditis or pericarditis. Heart failure most commonly also is divided into two different types, right and left sided. Failure of the right side of the heart is defined as ineffective right ventricular contractile function and may result from acute conditions such as a pulmonary emboli or an infarction, but most commonly results due to a previous left sided ventricular failure. These kind of symptoms that manifest with right sided heart failure are more systemic, so you're going to see hepatomegaly, splenomegaly, peripheral edema, ascites. JVD, increased central venous pressure, and also jaundice due to the hepatomegaly causing slight impaired liver function. So for failures of the left ventricle, it's described as the disturbance of the contractile function of the left ventricle resulting in low cardiac output. The subsequent low cardiac output is also going to increase systemic vascular resistance which is going to lead to a condition otherwise known as high afterload. The symptoms of left-sided heart failure or left ventricular failure are going to be more pulmonary in nature. So you're going to see orthopneas, dyspnea, shortness of breath, pulmonary congestion, pulmonary edema, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, um, low exercise tolerance. Those are going to be the main kind of signs and symptoms. You may also see um, blood in the sputum, but it's more that's more of a late term kind of sign and symptom of it. If left untreated, like uh, previously discussed with right-sided heart failure, it may cause an increased backup in the pulmonary system, leading to increased pulmonary pressures and subsequently causing right-sided heart failure. Heart failure can also be broken up into two different types. Besides right and left, it can be either heart failure with preserved ejection fraction or heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. These were previously known as diastolic heart failure and systolic heart failure respectively. However, these were changed um, to these new monikers. Heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is reserved for patients with an ejection fraction above 50%, and heart failure with reduced ejection fraction is reserved for patients with an ejection fraction below 40%. The downside of this is that most of our heart failure treatments are aimed at patients with a low ejection fraction. So even if a patient does have preserved ejection fraction during heart failure, it's not likely that they're going to stay that way just due to the lack of research and treatment options available. The largest complications that arise during heart failure are from the neurohormonal compensatory mechanisms in the body that begin to kick in once metabolic needs of the tissues are not being met. In heart failure, the most prominent of these are the response from the sympathetic nervous system, the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, and if hypertension is present, hypertrophy. This process, if not controlled, ultimately is going to end up reshaping the ventricles in what is known as ventricular remodeling, which is also similar to that of acute MIs. We can create a linear path of what happens by knowing this subsequent train of neurohormonal mechanisms. So we start with the initial onset of heart failure. We get the low cardiac output state. Due to this, angiotensinogen is, is signaled to be created in the liver, and then it makes its way through the blood system to the kidneys. When the, when the kidneys sense the low cardiac output state, renin is released, and the renal arteries are vasoconstricted. Once angiotensinogen and renin meet, renin converts angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 then begins circulating through the blood and makes its way to the lungs. Once it's in the lungs, ACE is made, which is angioconverting enzyme, and angiotensin 1 is converted to angiotensin 2. Now, angiotensin 2 is a very potent vasoconstrictor. It also has numerous other side effects outside of that, including it is the main thing that causes ventricular remodeling in the body. So once angiotensin II is made, it increases stomach vascular resistance, blood pressure, cardiac workload, and it decreases cardiac output because the heart is not able to pump as is, so when we're trying to increase all these different forces, it's going to further decrease cardiac output. 
Angiotensin 2 also signals to the adrenal glands that aldosterone should be released, which is going to cause further retention of sodium and water, which is going to increase preload. And it can also decrease potassium levels, since potassium is solely dependent on dietary intake and aldosterone. So the more aldosterone that's in the body, the less potassium we have. This decrease in potassium is going to further predispose this patient to any kind of dysrhythmia that they were already predisposed to due to having an inadequate cardiac output and contractile function. So after aldosterone is released, we now have increased systemic vascular resistance, cardiac output is decreased, we have an increased blood pressure, we have sympathetic nervous system response increasing the contractile force and heart rate, we have an increased preload due to the fluid retention, and this is just a continuous cycle that is going to end up continuously worsening the symptoms of heart failure. So during the acute phases of heart failure where either medications not being used, um, new onset of heart failure where it's just been progressing and progressing with no medical intervention, or where doses aren't sufficient enough anymore to control heart failure. The intravenous use of diuretics to reduce preload is used. Um, Morphine is also going to be used to vasodilate and reduce anxiety, so it, they can help, it can, it's going to help the patients breathe. Drugs such as sodium nitroprusside or nitroglycerin are going to be used. This is both for, if we're using sodium nitroprusside or nipride, it's going to be for the arterial and venodilating effects to help reduce preload, reduce um, SVR or systemic vascular resistance. If it's nitroglycerin or other nitrates, it's going to be to dilate the coronary arteries mainly to allow adequate cardiac oxygen supply. We're also going to be doing an inc either an intravenous infusion of dopamine or dobutamine. This is going to be for contractile function. Um, typically, dobutamine is going to be used. Um, it's also used for very late stage heart failure towards the end of someone's life where palliative care is going to be on the horizon if it's not well controlled or you're going to need a heart transplant. But the, both of these are positive inotropes. They're also going to have some kind of vasodilating effect. Dopamine is more dose dependent on what it's going to do. Um, low doses, very low doses, it's going to dilate the renal mesenteric arteries. Um, moderate doses, it's going to help vasodilate and increase cardiac function. And then in higher doses, it acts, simple, it acts similar to um, norepinephrine or levofed. Um, once the acute phase has been resolved, however, um, we're switched over to oral agents. So these include your ACE inhibitors, so we're going to stop that RAAS cycle. Um, we also use low-dose beta blockers, but you have to be careful with beta blockers as you don't want to reduce the contractile function of the heart when it's already having dysfunction of the left ventricle. Um, digoxin, especially if they have AFib going on, but with digoxin you have to be careful because since they have the hypokalemia already, you're posing a really big threat for toxicity. Um, as of now, this is all I'm going to discuss about heart failure. This is going to be the backbone of what you're going to need to know in theory and in your clinical setting as long as you know this. Um, mainly differentiating between left and right sided heart failure and knowing the considerations for both, you'll be absolutely fine. To reiterate about left and right sided, for right-sided heart failure, you're looking for more systemic manifestations. Your edema, your JVD, increased CVP, hepatomegaly, so you might see increased liver um, function tests. Whereas with your left-sided, you're looking at more pulmonary symptoms. So if you have a patient with left-sided heart failure, they're not going to tolerate exercise as well. So if you're trying to ambulate them, you have to take this into consideration that they might sat, they might not sat as well, they may not be able to walk as far, they might be starting to spew up more sputum, um, if hemoptysis does develop, you have to take that into consideration that they probably have a pronounced amount of fluid in their lungs at this point. So, you can think about more considerations in the bottom. I would always love to see more like feedback in the bottom about what you guys would think of more topics to discuss about this. We can go further into heart failure. Right now, I feel this is a good basis for it. There's not too much we need to go further into for just this topic. Mainly the neurohormonal pathways would be the area to go to, but I'm sure I'll make a video down the line about the RAS cycle, um, either on itself or during a discussion about myocardial infarctions. So that's going to be all for this video. Uh, leave your feedback in the comments about what kind of video you'd like to see in the future. And as always, thank you for watching.